Hi, Theater Pizzazz. I'm Meredith Heyman. I'm so excited to be talking Broadway with all of you. And joining me today is the director of the new musical, The Heart of Rock and Roll, Gordon Greenberg. Gordon, thank you so much for being here and congrats on your upcoming Broadway show. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me first thing in the morning. It's great Absolutely. to get up and Absolutely. jump on. Right? I mean, it's not going to be like a long theater day for you at all. So we'll, we'll start bright and early. Uh, does Huey Louie music pump you up? on an early morning uh, like today? There is no better way to get the, the juices flowing. We do, it's so funny because in the mornings, Lauren Latar, our choreographer and I love to do warm ups like British style. Okay. Um, the first time I directed a show in England, it was news to me that the first half hour of every day is a warm up. Um, and it's, I'm not sure if it's like liability insurance or <laughs> it's just tradition, but they do it. And at first, of course, I got there like so, uh, eager to get as much time as I could. So I'm like, do we get another half hour on the back end? And they said, <laughs> no, that's it's a half hour out of the day. And very quickly, I started loving it because it gets everyone on the same page. It's a moment for stage managers, PAs, everyone in the room gets up and like moves their body and we listen to pop music and it's just a great wake up call. So we've been doing that. But the interesting thing is here, we don't want to listen to anything other than Huey Lewis. Like, we're, <laughs> How sense. can it get better? His music, sense. they're all bops, all the songs. Absolutely. So, so beyond being bops, what makes them ripe for musical theater? They feel like they were written for the theater. All of them have this great emotional sweep behind them in a, in a very positive way. You know how you always tell an actor, like, play the positive. You have to pick a positive emotion or action, rather, to play, um, to get a propulsiveness in, in the show, in the narrative. And all of his songs have that, whether it's even even the, the sense of humor um, that's infused in them, like Stuck With You um, or uh, Back In Time or Hip To Be Square, there's always a little cheekiness in them. So I feel like his songs, in addition to being positive, like this show, live kind of a foot off the ground. There's this sort of sense of magic um, and uh, almost, like vacation in them, um, not far off from Mamma Mia. I think the way the the ABBA songs just made people feel, um, and in the way that people walked into the theater, probably thinking they knew two or three ABBA songs, and by the end, either you know them all or you want to know them all. It's very similar here, um, and the story is full of generosity of spirit and really inspired by the sensibility of Huey himself, which if you've seen The Greatest Night in Pop on Netflix, which I highly recommend, that gives you a great sense of his humility, his humor, his humanity. Um, and that all inspired, well, this is not uh, a bio musical, it's not about him, but it's definitely um, fueled by his sensibility. Um, and you get it really clearly in that film. Um, which made me cry and laugh and feel uh, the hairs on the back of my neck go up. Um, just all the great things that a musical should do. So I feel like he and his music were always ripe for this musical treatment. And when they first called me, it's almost 10 years ago oh. and said, would you be interested? Here's a sketch of what we want to do with it. I immediately thought John Hughes movie. I'm back in the eighties, which was, you know, just a beautiful, innocent mm -hmm. era, uh, which in the 80s, I was look, probably wanting to watch Greece and look back at what was my parents' innocent era. Um, but now the 80s kind of feel like that to me. And this whole show is a love letter to the 1980s. It, it, it uses all of the classic character archetypes um, from everything from Revenge of the Nerds to every John Hughes movie to St. Elmo's Fire. Um, but people um, really, really do uh, uh, act in ways that are kind hearted. And even as they're struggling to figure out who they are, really the idea of the show is about two young people who are staring down 30 and trying to figure out what it means to perhaps outgrow the dreams you thought were everything to you. Not, not dissimilar from someone who grows up wanting to be an astronaut or a ball player and all of a sudden you're 30 and you're not a failure if you don't play for the Yankees or you don't land on the moon. Um, what you are is growing up and evolving and understanding that ultimately being someone, being 
you know, we would say like a macher or a mensch, um, a great, a big person is not necessarily having a million fans. It's having one fan. It's mm -hmm. having one family and being important to that person, to the people that really matter and thinking of your life as having depth and scope as opposed to just length, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, what so that's, that that's all wrapped up. Yeah, yeah. And what does that mean for you? Because you've been chasing the theater dream, working the theater dream, living the theater dream for a very long time. But this show talks about, as you said, the very hey, long, we're, yes. we love having you here. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> um, but this show talks about, as you mentioned with dreams, like also pursuing a second chance at them. So does that have any connection to you? Or as you did, as you said, is it about realizing, you know, a different version of the dream that's maybe a more personal one. For sure. I think there are a few things that I have, um, that have occurred to me over the years. I mean, I was in my first Broadway show when I was 13 years old with Anthony Rapp, um, when I was still at Stage Door Manor. Um, and so I've always known that this was going to be the world that I, I wanted to be a part of. But I also kind of took a detour. I went to Stanford for a while and I decided to try and direct commercials and I did that. And then I went back to acting and then I moved into directing and added writing and I've been writing TV. And I am um, I am an adventurer and uh, constantly kind of curious to explore new, uh, new possibilities. And I think people who have um, a love for theater, a love for storytelling, um, and art and and creating um, do experience that evolution of what your dream is. But the other big lesson for me that took a minute was to understand, as Pippin says, um, if I'm never tied to anything, I'll never be free. Um, and that's kind of a classic um, story that I think many of us kind of experience that at the beginning of of that play, he wants to be extraordinary which is a lot like our prime uh, sort of central character, Bobby, played by Corey Cott, um, who just wants to be important, wants to be important. Um, and then by the end understands what being important is and that being important, achieving greatness can be in figuring out how to be in a long-term relationship. It's also the show I'm doing after this in uh, at the Menier um, Chocolate Factory in London is The Baker's Wife, which I worked on years ago with Joe Stein. And that has a very similar idea too at its heart, which is the courage, the stamina, the commitment and and thoughtfulness and openness and vulnerability that it takes to commit to a person, to a thing, to an idea for a long time. And that once, you, once you're ready to do that, there is great reward in it um, that comes from the mileage itself. Absolutely. Now, going back to Heart of Rock and Roll, and as you mentioned, it's a love letter to the 80s and some of our favorite um, things from the 80s, the movies, John Hughes movies. Do you have a favorite? Do you have a favorite that's referenced in the show? Well, it's I mean, my favorite was always Ferris Bueller was like my spirit animal growing up. Yeah. Um, and I love Matthew and I've since worked with him lots of times, but um, usually understudying. But I... Uh, I think what this show does beautifully is we take a lot of these tropes and then open them up uh, and, and sort of flesh them out in a different way. So Paige, who's kind of her best friend and is like the party girl from Girls Just Want to Have Fun that you meet hanging upside down with the crimped hair and <laughs> all of the crazy glitter. Ultimately, she's someone in this version who's just had a baby and has lost track of herself and hasn't been out of the house in six months. And she's trying to like, figure out who she is now on this side of being a mother um, or Cassandra um, who is uh, kind of the central character female um, who has given up her high-flying life in Chicago sort of like Demi Moore in San Elmo's Fire um, when her mom passes away and had to go back to her dad's house and help write the company and, and put everything back together and she's re-examining, rethinking what she wants out of life. And then Bobby, who has given up on music and has decided I don't need to live out my father's dream. It's kind of like The Iron Claw, which I saw the other day, such a good movie. Um, but they've inherited this idea or dream or goal from their parents, because that's all we know when we're kids is that's that's what's shaping our um, sense of the world. Um, 
and he has decided to forego that and start a new life um, and and go, you know, sort of go norm core, so to speak. Um, and that is a whole other journey. Um, and really what the show is about is when the old dream pops up next to the new dream and he's got to kind of figure out what making a choice in life means, which is being okay with not doing something. It's the road you didn't take, you know. Yeah. Um, why am I just full of quotes today from from other shows? <laughs> but it's it's sliding doors. It's yeah. just one of those things that as an adult, you start to realize that for every choice you make, there's a choice you didn't and being okay with that and committing to the one that you did. Um, so these are lessons that all of these people are learning throughout the show. Um, and then there are, you know, sort of this, the other central character is um, Tamika Lawrence's character. And she's, I can't say enough wonderful things about her. Um, and she's one of my favorite new people um, to meet. Uh, but she is someone who had given up also what she expected to please her mother. Um, and in the course of this, by the end of her arc, she's kind of rediscovering it. And um, sometimes it takes a minute to gain the courage uh, to actually take that risk and, yeah. and go for something. Yeah. Yeah. So now let's talk about our main person, man of the hour, Huey Lewis, working with him. He said at the opening night of Back to Future, of Back to the Future, and we have like an embarrassment of Huey Lewis riches on Broadway now. We have Huey Lewis music in Back to the Future. We have a whole Huey Lewis musical with Heart of Rock and Roll. But he said that theater artists are just the hardest working people in show business. And he, you know, tipped his hat to them. Um, what's it like working with him, though? He is incredibly kind and generous and definitely a rock star. So he- in the best uh, way? In the best way. He has a very different perspective on theater, on on obviously his music, um, and on everything that we put into the show. He definitely has great input, also knows when to kind of take a step back, let us make something, comes back to the room and gives his, his thoughts, which are incredibly additive and shift your perspective sometimes because we can also get a little myopic and caught in our own little zones. Um, and then he says, did you ever think of this? Here's what happened to me. Maybe this is instructive um, or interesting. Um, and this also happened at the point in his life where he began to lose his hearing and had to stop touring. That's when we started this journey at the Old Globe about seven years ago. Um, so that's not insignificant to his um, uh, psychology and to where this sits in his life. Um, and we've always known that that's a, a significant responsibility um, for us uh, so that this whole show has to honor him and honor, you know, the kind of the joy and uplift and buoyancy that every music video of his always had and that he always had. Um, he's someone who's always just a, a little bit out over his skis, if that makes sense. There's always a sense of like, I'm not sure what's going to happen, which is also what makes for great theater. Yeah. You know, you should go into a theater and always feel a little bit of a sense of danger, even in a sweet infection of a show like this. There is truth, there is soul, there is humanity at the center of it. And that's what people can believe in to make them feel that uplift. Yeah. Let's talk about another uplifting show of yours. We had Dracula, a comedy of errors off Broadway uh last year i mean well really up until actually a comedy of terrors <laughs> comedy of terrors of course of course yeah but you got it you definitely you got you got the the right, uh, we the did, right? i did there. that intentionally <laughs> of course of course um we had that on off broadway just until recently and also really just bringing light no horror but such a funny fun production what does it mean to have both of you know those uh, these productions, these types of productions on on the boards in the district this season? And are we going to see new life for Dracula possibly next year, possibly next Halloween? You tell me, I'll be there. Yes and yes. Um, we, first of all, it's it's an honor. And this these are both projects that I've been shepherding for years. Um, and I think they came at just the right time um, as the world sort of gets more and more complicated and difficult and, and um, brain breaking. 
uh, these shows um, sort of help you see a path through to, to happiness and uplift. Um, and, you know, last year I was deep in a production that I'm very proud of, of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, um, but that was Heavy. challenging in all the best ways. Yeah, it had great, great heft and getting under the hood of a, a genius play like that can really take you through um, some difficult emotions and all to the betterment and and the uh, uh, and and the 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 strength of that play. Um, however, having this as an antidote is really great. Um, so this past year has been a really wonderful uh, joy ride between these two shows, which are both um, highly complex highly choreographed, highly skilled, and very thought through. You know, to make a meringue, um, it takes a lot of movement. And just because you beat an egg doesn't mean it's going to become a meringue. So uh, you have to do it skillfully. And I feel like with with uh, Dracula, Steve Rosen and I really thought a lot about why we were bringing it to New York. And as it evolved from, we worked on it in Florida at first at the Malt, and then significantly at um, Chicago Shakes um, with Rick Boynton there, he's a brilliant dramaturg, and then in Canada. Um, and bringing it to New York, we really thought a lot about why and what it had to offer right now, um, and about how Bram Stoker was, uh, it's largely reported, uh, queer and in the closet. And we sort of tried to import that and lift up some of the subtext um, to the fore. Uh, and that paid off beautifully um the show is now we're putting together the next production is going to be in london next year um uh there are we're in talks about maybe bringing it back as an annual thing in new york as well but london is next um and then australia uh so i'm very excited that the show continues to um sort of uh be seen all over the world and those are the productions that will be tied to us directly um uh, there are lots of people who are now going to be doing it in other places. We're also doing it, I should I should pitch this at the Old Globe, is gonna happen in August, September. Um, and the Old Globe is uh, and has been an artistic home for myself and for Steve Rosen. And they just, they were about to do another commission, um, but last year we premiered um, a version of Crime and Punishment called Crime and Punishment, a comedy, which we created also, which has as little to do with the actual novel um, as Dracula <laughs> with the actual novel. We played fast and loose with it. Love it, love it. Well, there's so much exciting Gordon Greenberg that we can be seeing. First up, though, will be Huey Lewis on Broadway this spring. So excited for that. Gordon, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. I can't wait to see you at the theater. Absolutely, ditto. And stay yeah. right here with Theater Pizzazz for more interviews and theater news. I'm Meredith Heyman. We'll see you next time.